My name is Alexander Selström and I'm a PhD student at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. I will give you an overview of the work that I and my supervisor, Professor Chris Williams, have carried out which we present in our paper, Tension Principle Curvature Cable Nets on Minimal Surfaces. Soap film has virtually no thickness and therefore virtually no weight and can be used to physically form fine minimal surfaces. Fryotto knew this and made a very large number of soap film models to form find his many cable net structures. He used to materialize his soap film models using equal mesh nets. Equal mesh nets have quadrilateral faces whose sides are of equal length but the faces must not be squares. However, it is only possible to approximate a minimal surface with an equal mesh net. Form finding principle curvature cable nets are also relevant for other non minimal surfaces which have negative Gaussian curvature. These can be considered approximately minimal and include compressed structures such as fan walls, cooling towers and others. Any non-flat surface have curvature and we may quantify this in several ways. The principal curvatures are the maximum and minimum values of the normal curvature of the surface. From these values we get the mean curvature, the Gaussian curvature and the radius of Mohr circle of curvature. For minimal surfaces, the principal curvatures are equal but of opposite sign, and therefore the mean curvature is zero and the Gaussian curvature is negative. In our paper, we use tensor notation when we describe our surfaces, which is useful when considering both geometry and stresses. These expressions are some of the more important things from classical differential geometry, which allows us to calculate distances on the surface and how the normal varies. Some may be more familiar with curvilinear coordinates, denoted U and V, or recognize the first and second fundamental forms as capital letters EFG, respectively small letters EFG. By definition, the principal curvature directions are orthogonal and conjugate directions. However, the covariant base vectors, which are tangential to the coordinate systems, are in general not. To make the coordinate system follow the principal curvature directions, we have to impose some properties. To make them orthogonal, we require a12 to be 0, and to be conjugate, we require b12 to be 0. We will from time to time also discuss asymptotic directions, and these are directions on the surface where the normal curvature is 0. By drawing more circle of curvature, we can find these directions in relation to the principal curvature directions. From the circles, we see that an elliptic surface have no asymptotic directions and the sphere is a special case of such. A parabolic surface, which only curves in one direction, have exactly one asymptotic direction. And a hyperbolic surface have exactly two. A plane have an infinite number of asymptotic directions and any direction is an asymptotic direction. Minimal surfaces are a special case of hyperbolic surfaces and we can find that the asymptotic directions are always aligned at 45 degree angle to the principal curvature directions. Any surface can be mapped to the unit sphere using the Gauss map. The map registers the surface unit normal of a point onto the unit sphere. We may then project the image under the Gauss map onto the horizontal plane using stereographic projection. The points on the plane are given by the intersection of the plane and a line through the point on the Gauss map and a focal point on the sphere. And in this picture, we have used the south pole for our projection. With a net of cables following the principal curvature directions, it is possible to produce true pretension minimal surfaces, subjected only to the limitation of the fineness of the grid. The cable net will then form an isothermal mesh that is a pattern of curvilinear squares. Our paper describes the requirement needed to analytically construct such surfaces. This involves the understanding of a number of mappings resulting in various images of the surface, like the Gauss map and the stereographic projection. There is also the Weierstrass NAPIR parameterization, which we will return to a little bit later. This image depicts a minimal surface P, where the red curves follow the principal curvature directions and the blue the asymptotic directions. If a cable net is constructed following principal curvature directions on a minimal surface with constant force density, the cable net will be in static equilibrium. This fact can be used to, in a very simple way, numerically form find 
the surface and the principal curvature net simultaneously. And this is what we have done to produce this image. The force density is the element tension divided by the element length. And if the covariant base vectors are aligned with the principal curvature directions, the vector representing the force in each element is simply the force density multiplied with the covariant base vector. This movie shows the form finding procedure for a portion of the surface connected to the rest of the surface via symmetry. The tension coefficient can be set arbitrary, so as a converging criterion, we may study the ratio between the sum of the element lengths in one direction and the sum of the element lengths in the other. We do this for both the principal curvature directions and the asymptotic directions. In addition to moving the nodes around during the form finding, we move the position of the support slowly upwards and the free edge slowly outwards. This is a variation of Plateau's problem where not only the minimal surface through a given boundary is found, but also the boundary itself. Using this form finding approach, not only minimal surfaces with cables following the principal curvature directions can be form found, but any grid layout may be form found, such as minimal surfaces with cables following the asymptotic directions, as in the roof to the right. The left and right cable net roof share the same underlying minimal surface, and their images under the Gauss map and the stereographic projection of the Gauss map are similar to one another except for the orientation of the interior grid. Nevertheless, with an arbitrary grid, equilibrium of the boundary tells us that the curvature of the boundary must be constant and lie in the local tangent plane to the surface. This means that the boundary must follow the asymptotic directions. The force in each boundary will be constant along its length and thus have varying force density, which is an exception from the requirement of a net with constant force density. During the form finding of these structures, the force in the cables were set constant throughout the form finding. But there are occasions when the force in the boundaries need to be changed during form finding to be able to achieve equilibrium. Let us now leave the numerical form finding for a while and focus on the analytic construction of minimal surfaces with principal curvature coordinates. We do not have sufficient time to explain the mathematics of this during this presentation. But it takes as departure a pair of complex surfaces with position vector P and Q, which together form a complex surface R as P plus the imaginary number times Q. The surfaces P, Q and R takes the complex coordinate zeta equals theta superscript 1 plus the imaginary number times theta superscript 2 as an argument. By applying the Weierstrass NEP parametrization on R, we can map a complex point zeta in complex space to a real point on a minimal surface in three-dimensional real space. However, without imposing any constraints on this mapping, the minimal surface will in general not have coordinates following principal curvature directions nor asymptotic directions. The pair of surfaces P and Q share the same unit normal and therefore the same Gauss map, and this is what we have used to construct the constraints that we need. Suppose that we seek principal curvature coordinates on P and asymptotic coordinates on Q. Then, upon differentiating the surface unit normal as seen on the Gauss map and comparing with results that we presented in the paper, we can find a relation between the surface unit normal and the covariant base vectors of P. Besides constructing nets in static equilibrium on surfaces P and Q, we may construct a net in static equilibrium on the Gauss map. The picture shows the principal stress trajectories of a sphere loaded with equal and opposite wrenches, that is, a combination of a force and a twisting moment along the same axis. This axis do not in general coincide with the axis of the sphere. But instead of a net of cables in tension whose forces are proportional to the element lengths, as in the case with the minimal surface, we will on the Gauss map have a grid of struts in compression and ties in tension whose forces are inversely proportional to the element lengths. So the shorter the member, the more force. The principal stress trajectories are given by the equation shown below the sphere. The real constant alpha controls the position of the wrenches, and if alpha tend to infinity, the wrenches are applied at the north and south poles. 
The complex constant beta controls the ratio between the actual force and the twisting moment. After some manipulation and applying the Weierstrass NAP parameterization, we can obtain a corresponding minimal surface P. A portion of this surface is shown in the image to the right. By varying alpha and beta, we may obtain the well-known catenoid and the helicoid. Let us now consider a Fryato I, which is a minimal surface with a hole in the shape of a non-planar drop. It can be form fine physically using soap film and a cotton thread making a loop. Before the loop is lifted out of the plane, the drop is a pure circle, but as it is lifted upwards, it forms a drop. In the beginning of this lifting process, there is infinite curvature at the lifting point, and this is the case until we have lifted the loop so that the angle of the apex of the drop reaches 90 degrees when the curvature becomes finite. We may also form fine FRI to I numerically, and here we have done that with a grid following asymptotic directions lifted so that the angle at the lifting point is 90 degrees to give a non-zero curvature. The lifting force needed can be found considering the vertical force in the catenoid which the surface tends to when the lifting goes to infinity. Here we see the form found surface again and we can easily get the stereographic projection of the corresponding Gauss map. In our paper we have also made an attempt to construct the same surface analytically. The attempt begins with a map onto the complex plane of the stereographic projection. The power of uh, 4 over 3 is there to produce the cusp on the right hand side in the stereographic projection. We have managed to get similar shapes for our numerical and analytical solution of this uh, shape, but we have still some work to do until we have a perfect match between the two. We would like to end this presentation with some remarks about our interest in asymptotic directions. And this applies not only to minimal surfaces, but to any surface with negative Gaussian curvature, which, as mentioned before, can be considered approximately minimal. So, of the objects in this picture, it applies to the entire hyperbolic paraboloid-shaped crisp and parts of the banana with negative Gaussian curvature. But it does not at all apply to the parts where the Gaussian curvature of the banana is positive. Neither does it apply to the pens nor the table, since these have zero Gaussian curvature. Let's focus on the crisp. We assume its self-weight to be insignificant in comparison to applied loads and that it is stress-free in its unloaded state. The crisp is supported on its lower side on two points and loaded on its upper side at two other points. If the points are chosen carefully so that we can find asymptotic curves running between the loading points and the supporting points, the loads will be transported through the surface as a twisting moment along the asymptotic curves, and the rest of the surface will remain stress-free. And since no load is applied other than at the points, the forces along the asymptotic curves must be constant, but the twisting moment will vary. We may understand this twist by considering the point loads as uniformly distributed loads acting on a small curvilinear patch whose sides are following asymptotic directions. One of these two curves in each direction will then deviate upwards from the tangent plane of the small patch and the other will deviate downwards as we move away from the patch along the curves. The twisting moment is proportional to the rate of change of the total deviation of these curves from the tangent plane of the patch load or, in other words, proportional to the rate of change of the normal. The crisp is a hyperbolic paraboloid in which the asymptotic curves are straight lines, so the rate of change is constant and the twisting moment therefore varies linearly. But, in general, the asymptotic curves are not straight lines, so the twisting moment will vary nonlinearly, and this is the case for the minimal surface we discussed earlier. So, in conclusion, a grid shell with members following the asymptotic lines on a doubly curved surface will transfer loads only through actual forces along the members and do, in theory at least, not rely on any bending capacity. And we may use this knowledge to construct not only minimal surface carrying membrane stresses in tension, but also those carrying compressive stresses or a combination of the two. With that, we would like to thank you for listening and we look forward to discuss our paper further with you.